Hi everyone, meteorologist Steve Caparata back with another episode of Coast and Climate. Obviously, we're well into hurricane season now, but the heart, the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season is just about upon us. And we're coming off a couple of historic seasons, including here along the northern Gulf Coast. So I thought for this week, nobody better to bring in than somebody that gets such a unique perspective on these storms and hurricanes and sees them in a way that only most of us can imagine. So with that, let me introduce Jeremy DeHart. He's a, a weather officer with the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, better known as the Hurricane Hunters at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. Hey, Jeremy, good morning. Hey, Steve, good morning. Appreciate you being here. So um, as I said, you're one of the Hurricane Hunters. Tell everybody a little bit about, uh, first off, um, your background, you know, your training in meteorology and how you ended up with the hurricane hunters. Sure. Uh, I'm a, so I am a meteorologist uh, with the Air Force, so a weather officer. Um, I went to North Carolina State for undergraduate um, meteorology degree. And uh, I spent 12 years on the active duty side of the Air Force doing more traditional uh, weather support uh, forecasting for airfields and aircraft and uh, those sort of things. And I joined the Hurricane Hunters uh, as a uh, airborne meteorologist about six years ago. So I separated from active duty. We're a reserve unit. So I separated from active duty to come uh, do this job. And uh, for, for a weather guy, there's, there's no better job in the world, if you ask me. So tell us a little bit about what you actually do on those flights. We're going to, as, as we work our way through here, uh, the interview, we'll roll a couple of videos, but just tell everybody, everybody a little bit about what your responsibilities are as you fly into the storms and you fly into the hurricanes. What are you actually doing uh, uh, more, uh, when you're on board the plane? So as the meteorologist, uh, I'm essentially the mission director for uh, any, any storm missions that we fly. So um, I'm, I'm telling the crew where, where to go to best uh, capture all the data that we need from the storm uh, for, for a hurricane, for tropical missions. Our, our main goal is to fix or to locate the center, the exact center of the storm. So um, in conjunction with the National Hurricane Center, We'll come up with a plan uh, with initial uh, like latitude and longitude to shoot for. And then it's basically my job uh, in the storm environment to use the winds, to use the other meteorological data that we're collecting from the storm to gather that uh, data and, and get us to the center. And then, um, as I mentioned, gathering the data, the plane is constantly... Uh, gathering real-time data from the storm environment as we're flying flying across it. And so we're instantaneously sending that data via satellite communications to the National Hurricane Center so they can update uh, their models and their forecasts and advisory products. And so you've been at this for a number of years now. I wanted to roll quickly. Um, this was uh, from a tweet that uh, I think you had shared a year or two ago. Uh, but uh, four major hurricanes there in the Gulf of Mexico. That was quick. Let me play it one more time. Four major hurricanes there in the Gulf of Mexico. And we'll play it back one more time. Harvey, Irma, Michael, and Laura. And as I think I remember from the tweet, uh, you said you had worked all of those storms, right? Right. Not only uh, flew those, but flew the landfall missions. Though. So that, that particular satellite loop, I was basically in the plane flying through at each at each of those points and so uh wow what a wild ride it's been the first couple of years i mean a lot a lot of people have gone through this job without uh for 20 30 years without flying a category five and i've flown three of them in my first six years so it's been um incre incredibly busy uh time but um very exhilarating uh as well and um but uh, it, I, I guess in our line of work, you know, we want a, a balance of, of, of storms to fly um, and but hope for the best as far as impacts. Now, those were four pretty memorable hurricanes here in the Gulf of Mexico. Can you pick out one storm in particular in your time that stands out as maybe the most memorable? 
Yeah, I'd say the the landfall mission of Hurricane Michael back in 2018, which is the one uh, that you know impacted the 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 Florida uh, Panhandle and just continued to strengthen right up until landfall. Which uh, again, that was the mission I flew was the landfall mission. Uh, in particular, the very last pass we flew through that was from south to north, and um, we dropped about 2,000 feet in altitude uh, on the last eye wall pass. And so we came in the eye wall at 10,000 feet, which is typically where we try to stay. And we ended up at 8,000 by the time we were in, in the eye, just because of all, all the turbulence uh, and flying through is some of the worst weather I've, I've been in in the storm environment to where we basically had to kind of ca- gather ourselves in the eye, make a couple passes and find a better uh, a patch of clear air on the way out. And so we know that that storm and post analysis from the Hurricane Center was, ended up being a Category 5, which we felt every bit of that. I, I, that's something I think most of us can't imagine is a 2,000 foot drop. My goodness. Um, so with that, I'm going to roll another video. This is uh, from Michael. Um, I don't know, is this that final pass that you were referencing? It is actually that was so that was in the eye after after that final pass through the eye wall and you can just you can just see the structure of it um, you know we we te- we try to get a lot of these kind of pictures and videos and um, but not every storm looks like that and I don't know if you can tell but this the, the vertical we, this is what we call the stadium effect in in the eye and so it's like standing in the middle of a football field and looking at the, the seats uh, surrounding you going straight up and that's basically what it was even more so this is more like a cylinder than a typical stadium it was just straight up and down wall uh all the way around and you can see absolute clear sky in the middle so just in a, a perfectly formed uh hurricane at that point do you remember the first time you got into a good clear eye? You know, Michael's such an extreme example, but do you remember the, the first time you really got into a good clear eye and, and got a view anything similar to what, I mean, that's such an extreme one, but uh, what, what's the first one you really remember? Uh, boy, the first one I really remember, um, you know, we actually, as the weather officer, we don't get to see those images very often. Uh, we don't have one of the better seats in the airplane, to be honest. We, we sit in the back. We're actually facing backward, and I've got a little tiny window uh, to fly. So that was kind of a, a unique uh, experience to be able to actually take some time to, to take that video. Normally, we're the, as the weather officer, we're, in the, we're the busiest we are when we're flying through the eye. So maybe have a a chance to take a quick peek and snap a picture or a five second video and go back to work. Um, so uh, that was absolutely the most memorable, being able to spend a little more time in the storm in- environment. Um, I would say uh, Hurricane Matthew, actually, my my first season, I was still in training, uh, which ended up impacting uh, along the, the South Carolina coast, but it skirted the east coast of, of Florida. And it looked like it could have been devastating for what was the space coast of Florida and just stayed offshore. And um, I actually lived in uh, Melbourne, Florida. I was stationed at Patrick Air Force Base uh, during my active duty days. I knew a lot of people there. And uh, my, you know, my attention was kind of halfway split between the job we had to do and just worrying about the people on the ground from the area I grew up in. That, That one sticks out to me as well. And, and that's something um, that you still live with now, I'm sure, being in Biloxi, right? So you face the storm threats there. Uh, but since you referenced, Matthew, it's a storm people in Baton Rouge might remember for a totally different reason. But um, Gainesville was under the gun with, with that one. LSU was supposed to play Florida and Gainesville. And it was a big controversy. That game got uh, kind of canceled and, and moved to Baton Rouge that year. So that's a storm that people in Baton Rouge remember for that reason, for a whole different reason. I wanted to roll another video. So obviously, you know, um, it's been not only incredibly busy over the Atlantic the last couple of years, but Louisiana in particular has taken some hard hits. So this is a video from.
penetrating the eye wall as well as it as it comes here. So you were on this one too, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, I see the sound kind of kicked in right as you were asking your question. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so I was saying, um, I'm going to roll it again, but I have a, a video from Hurricane Laura. We'll roll that. I think it's, uh, you were on this flight as well. I'm going to show in a second. So as I show this video here, just a second uh, from Laura, tell us what you remember about Laura. Yeah, Laura was interesting uh, because we actually flew that one tandem with uh, was Hurricane Marco at the time, and they were they were two storms that had formed back to back uh, in the Gulf simultaneously. And initially, uh, Keesler Air Force Base here in Biloxi was was threatened by by uh, by Laura. So we were flying Marco, and then we had to fly that, and we ended up landing. I want to say it was Charleston, South Carolina, to continue to fly missions from there. And of course, uh, Laura ended up taking a bit of a westward turn uh, more toward uh, Louisiana. And um, I remember just the logistics and how busy we were just continuing to fly those storms. And then, uh, of course, the, the power of Laura, how quickly that strengthened as it as approached the Louisiana coast. Now, I want to roll one more. So this video I'm going to show, I don't think you were on this particular flight. You and I talked a little bit beforehand, uh, but you did fly at least once into Ida. And I think as Ida was in intensifying pretty rapidly, so as I roll this one, tell me a little bit about what you remember about Ida. Yeah, Ida was another one we had to forward locate leave uh, Biloxi to fly. I think we were flying that one out of uh, San Antonio at the time. And um, I got another one that just kind of the theme of the last several years with these major hurricanes, just the rapid intensification that we saw. The, the, fl the flight I flew into Ida was a night flight, and uh, we only ended up flying one alpha pattern, we call one, one X or two passes through the storm. And it jumped from category two to category four in that time frame. In, an hour and a half, which is just incredible. Yeah, and I want to come back to uh, Michael for a minute. You mentioned that 2,000 uh, foot drop in that one. Um, I have a tweet of yours here I want to bring up. Um, you tweeted after that one, uh, we got our clocks cleaned, right, by Michael. That was pretty rough. And people can see kind of yeah. on the uh, right side of that tweet, you shared another graphic. I'm going to pull that up bigger. Tell people what they're looking at here in this graphic that maybe explains even a little more about just how rough that was, uh, that, that penetration into Michael. Yeah, well, the, the, two, uh, the two lines uh, basically indicate the amount of pitch and roll of the aircraft. So um, how much the, the wings are rotating up and down and how much the nose is rotating up and down. And obviously what we, nor what we like to see in a normal situation is those lines pretty stable. Um, but that inbound eye wall, it, it was just uncontrollable. And that's essentially what I was describing when we were flying through. We actually got turned to where we were parallel with the eye and we had to make another or with the eye wall flying into the eye wall uh, along it. And we had to make another uh intentional turn back into the eye just because the storm was basically flying us at that point. And so um, what I had mentioned is we found, we tried to use radar to find a, a bit of a more clearer patch of air on the outbound, which is why it was a little smoother heading outbound. But that, that inbound uh, eye wall is nothing but we ever want to, we ever want to see. No, I, I simply, I can't imagine what that was like. And I want to bring up a, another tweet you shared from that storm. Uh, there was a meteorologist here from WGNO uh, TV in New Orleans on board this flight, I think, with you at the time. Uh, but you mentioned here in the tweet that you can hear autopilot. We'll play this video with, with some audio. And
this, I think, gives people a look at, look at the plane just getting jostled around. Um, and so is that about the time where you were losing that altitude? Yep, that, that was exactly the time. We're flying through that southern eye wall, plane just getting jostled around. And, uh, and the audio, if you could hear it in the background, uh, it, it, the autopilot is just repeating autopilot, autopilot. And what that means is the autopilot has kicked off. Um, and we're having the, the pilots are basically having to fly it manually at that point. So they, we try to keep it in autopilot for as long as they can, as long as they can, you know, with their hands on the on the on the on the rudder. But um, at, at some point, it's just not able to keep stable altitude. And so the pilots are having to fly it. And then you can see there right there it looks like that turn. If you can see the radar at the bottom as well. The, where the plane is is flying, it was basically aligned with the eye wall. That's kind of what I was describing. So we're having to, to, from that point, make another turn to get us out of that environment. So that was that was pretty scary stuff. I got to imagine that that, and that kind of leads me to my next question. I think that's what most people think about when they watch you guys. Is they think of you as brave for doing what you do, and they think that that it's got to be scary. So obviously, you had a scary moment there, and Michael. Um, any other scary moments you can recount in your time doing this? Uh, that was definitely the most dramatic. Uh, another storm that stands out is Hurricane Harvey, uh, which, of course, impacted the, uh, the southeast Texas coast back in 2017. And uh, Harvey was another one of those, uh, ended up being a Category 4 at landfall. but um, strengthened pretty much right up until landfall. And, um, we were having to make, we, we could hear, uh, mayday calls going out from boats caught in harbors trying to reach the coast guard and they were not able to. And we were actually, as we're flying through the storm, um, assisting the coast guard because we could hear them on the radios, assisting the coast guard with, uh, relaying that information so they could they could find them and and help them and rescue them. So again, there's there's always a human element of this, uh, especially with these landfall missions, as we're we're actually witnessing the storm impact people and people's livelihoods. Uh, absolutely, um, you know what you guys do is critical, and and we all uh, here along the Gulf Coast and in all coastal areas impacted by these storms. We really appreciate it. I do want to ask you two quick questions before I let you go. Number one, so obviously everybody knows what you do during hurricane season, but what do you do during sort of the the off season, if you will? The off season, no such thing as an off season for us. So we actually have a a winter season requirement as well, um, which has actually grown in scope the last couple of years. Um, so say for a nor'easter that's threatening the northeast, we will go fly, we'll call them kind of synoptic missions where we'll fly as high as we possibly can, usually around 30,000 feet, and we'll just circle uh, the storm environment and just drop a, a ton of drops on. So the, the idea is to initialize the global models better, give them better information so that they can handle uh, the, uh, the environment as the storm is uh, developing. And so there's kind of the East Coast mission that we've done historically. Uh, the last couple of years, we've been flying out west a lot in, uh, for what's the atmospheric river missions that uh, provide uh, the West Coast, uh, particularly the state of California, with a, a large chunk of its annual precipitation uh, in the months of let's say, January to March. And so we'll fly a lot of those missions out over the Pacific Ocean. And there's a lot to still understand about those. Of course, it's a very data sparse area out over the middle of the ocean. So we're, we're trying to provide as much data as we can to help those, uh, help those models decide, uh, determine where those atmospheric rivers are gonna impact the West Coast. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to make that clear that it is a year-round job for you guys. I want to roll one more quick video, and you can tell me if this is actually you, but uh, tell us what we're looking at. Uh, 
Um, that's a buoy mission. So um, we we also release in conjunction with usually the U.S. Navy um, will release uh, buoys. So our typical drop sign will measure the meteorological condi- conditions in the atmosphere as it's be- being released from the plane all the way down to the sea surface. So the buoy mission, the buoys uh, don't activate until they hit the sea surface. So their role, of course, is a little different measuring sea surface conditions, uh, temperatures, salinity, and those sorts of things. So we have a, a very wide ranging uh, uh, mission set for us uh, with the, the Air Force Hurricane Hunters. That, that's such a cool video to see, throwing the uh, buoy out the back of the plane, tethered, of course, uh, the, the loadmaster tethered there to keep it safe. But uh, pretty incredible what you got, uh, guys do. Jeremy, thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, as I said, we all appreciate it very much. And uh, obviously, stay safe this season, hopefully a little bit quieter this year. We'll see how it turns out. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you again. So that's Jeremy DeHart with the Hurricane Hunters, the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron there, Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Remarkable. Remarkable the risk they take and remarkable how safe it is. Uh, They've been doing this for a long time and overall just have an an incredible safety record. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, We'll be back next Thursday at 10 o'clock with a new episode. And a reminder, you can catch all our episodes on WAFB Plus and on our website, WAFB.com. See you next week.